Welcome to the Doctor's Life Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Diane. Think of the podcast as a mobile doctor's lounge where we take some time out and explore topics that doctors are interested in related to what it means to be a doctor in today's world and creating a rich, satisfying, and meaningful life, as well as making the healthcare system better for doctors and patients. So, if you are a doctor, you'll feel right at home, and if you aren't a doctor, you'll get a better understanding of doctors and what we think about and talk about. I know you will enjoy the conversation. Let's jump in. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Doctor's Life Podcast. On today's episode, we are going to be talking about a super cool topic, fatherhood and medicine. It's something we haven't explored before, and I'm really excited to be able to explore this topic with Dr. Dave Draginas. He's a fellow anesthesiologist. <laughs> He's in private practice in the Dallas area, which I can relate to, too, because I was in private practice for 15 years. And he has a background as a U.S. Navy physician, so that gives him a really unique perspective on the practice of medicine. One of his passions is utilizing technology to scale the positive impacts that doctors can have on society. And as many of us do, he has his passions. So he's created anesthesiamist.com and doctorsunbound.com. And he has the Doctors Unbound podcast, which I was so happy to be a guest on uh, not too long ago. Dr. Dave, it's awesome to have you on the Doctors Life podcast today. Woohoo! Thank you for the introduction. (laughs) I'm excited to be on your podcast and uh, talk a little bit about medicine, well, fatherhood, all that kind of fun stuff. Yeah, I love it because being a physician, wellness coach, I'm always talking about the human aspect of medicine and of being humans as well as superhuman, doing superhuman things as doctors. So I love that we're talking about this today. It's interesting because obviously you've gone through medical school, residency, and you were in the Navy and you have a wife and kids. It's interesting. Like, how did you end up thinking about this topic of fatherhood? You know, it's, it's something that I think once you have children, it, you can't help but it kind of being, you know, on top of your mind. So, so for me, I've got, I've got three children. My daughter, Caitlin is, is five. Matthew is three ish. And our youngest Theo is not quite two years old. So uh, we, we got started a little bit late, so we kind of had them quickly. Um, (laughs) And, uh, and it's a ton of fun, but it's also makes for some craziness for, uh, you know, less sleep and all that kind of stuff. So of course, that engulfs a big part of my life now, which is great. Yeah, absolutely. I'm not a father, obviously, but I have two kids. They're, they're older. They're 17 and 19, 17-year-old daughter and 19-year-old son. And I got to tell you, being coming a parent was so big in my life. I'm sure it, in yours too, where you just don't realize how um, much capacity you have in your heart until you have kids. I mean, you love yourself, you love your family, you love your spouse. But uh, when you have those kids, man, it just changes your world in amazing ways. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And what I'll add to that is, you know, we had children a little bit later in life. And even being a physician, you know, done with my training, you think you'd feel like, hey, I, I'm so confident I've got this, but there's still this like, I think you never really feel ready to be a parent. At least that's how I felt. I never felt like I was, I was okay. <laughs> I, I've, got, I've got this all figured out. Um, but of course, you know, like you said, your, your, your capacity to love and, and boy, like how quickly they just, they just get your heart. That's such an amazing thing to experience. And then you just, you, you know, you figure it out as you go along. But it's, it's really interesting that even as physicians, you never quite feel ready, but just got to do it. Yeah, it is. It is kind of like that, even with the, my older kids. You know, you have your basis, but you're kind of making it up as you go along. What does fatherhood mean to you? 
Yeah, you know, I've, I've thought about this many times. And, you know, I think fatherhood is at the same time an immense privilege and also a huge you know, responsibility. I mean, here's another life or, or multiple lives in, in our case that is entrusted to you to guide, mm-hmm. to protect, you know, to develop, you know, their physical, emotional, spiritual well-being. That's a lot. Like if you really think about it, that's that's a huge responsibility. But at the same time, you know, enmeshed in all this is is everything that you get back with with being a parent you know all of that sort of unconditional love from them it really is an an, an amazing exchange yeah and i would say too that it's a wonderful <laughs> personal development tool being a coach i'm always thinking about these things and how uh, you can develop unconditional love for your kids too you know they it, it's there's nothing better you come home and They're like, dad, you know, and like Mm -hmm. jumping all over you and doing all that crazy stuff. You know, we've talked some about like how becoming a parent changes your world. And, you know, as soon as that first baby comes home, your world is completely changed. Has fatherhood changed your vision of the world, how you look at the world? You know, I think it has. I think I take more of a, you know, the the long view now. I, I, I think I take into consideration the long-term impact and effect of things. And, you know, as physicians, we kind of have to delay that gratification. It's, it's part of becoming a physician. You know, I, I tell people, patients sometimes, you know, because they ask about our training, I say, well, it's kind of like starting in first grade again after you're finished with high school and going through and finishing 12 grades up to high school again. Because, you know, on average, four years of college medical school and residency that's that's 12 years again so when they think about it that way they're like oh my gosh so so we have to delay that gratification but at the same time when when you're in the process of doing your training we have so many of these milestones you know getting through the next exam getting through the next rotation studying for boards so we have all these milestones that kind of have you so focused on the short term that i think sometimes you lose track of the long term and i think for me, what I noticed is when we had children, all of a sudden, you know, my horizon was thinking past their lifetime into their adulthood and then grandchildren and, you know, and further down the long. So I think that's one thing that's really cool about it is it really changes your horizon. So your the horizon becomes, yeah, instead of looking at the trees or the things that are just in your yard, right? You actually start looking at the horizon and looking at the, the future for the, the long term how does that translate into how you look at your career or how you practice medicine? You know, I think it's it's a little bit twofold. On the one hand, and, and we haven't prepped our kids like daddy's a doctor or anything like that, but, you know, I think kids can take some joy and, and be proud of the fact that, you know, we're physicians and the positive impact that we have on society. And like I said, we, we definitely don't coach this, but like we, we noticed my daughter, you know, she's five, like we, she would go out meeting strangers and she's like, my daddy's a doctor, you know, <laughs> which is, which is, you know, and my wife would be like, you know, s- you know, settle down, <laughs> you know, we're, we're not pushing that at all. But it was really interesting how she has sort of latched onto that. And in some ways, I've been a role model for her in that aspect. So I think that's something that I never really thought about in my career is that, hey, you know, you know, my kids can can see me as a, you know, as a strong role model for them. But, you know, the other aspect of it is finding balance um, Mm -hmm. because the practice of medicine can be so stressful, tough, long hours, all of those things. And you know, we have to be present for our kids. You know, what, what they want for, uh, from us more than anything else is our time and, and being there, being present, paying attention to them. So finding that time energy balance, I think is key. And I think about that more and more now that I have kids. And the third aspect of that question is personal health. Having kids a little bit later in life, I'm, I'm in my early 40s now. Mm-hmm. I think about my personal health and taking care of myself so that I can be there. I used to, I used to play a ton of basketball and, you know, I want to be there being able to play sports with them and challenge them and, and you know, and, and, and make them earn it. 
you know, I still, I still have that competitive drive in me, you know, my, my boys are young, but I, you know, I, I want to be able to still be in shape and, and be able to take them on on the basketball court when they get a little bit older. And, and of course, being there for their milestones as, you know, as they grow and show them colleges or get married or grandkids, like, I, you know, I want to be a part of all that. So, you know, I, I think about keeping myself healthy to be able to enjoy those things later in life. Yeah, I hear what you're saying. I think that comes up not only for men, but for women as well. And it's interesting. And I think your perspective is different than maybe like what a traditional, more traditional perspective would be. And I think it's just with this a sign of the times in our uh, field in medicine. Because I, I bet if I had asked that question of someone of an earlier generation, maybe even like 10 or 20 years ago, they would have said something more along the lines of like financial stability. You know, I've got to work super hard so that I can provide a good living for the family and pay for college and all of that. And that would have been like first and foremost, like how much work I have to do. I I do know that you are interested in financial responsibility and financial security as well. So I know that that, you know, that's on your mind as well, but I think it's interesting that you didn't mention that first and that's, I think it's kind of a sign of the times, but what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, no, I, I think you're right because I think, I think we're wrong if we think that kids you know, want us to give them things or give them money. I think if you look at any kids, take kids of, you know, of of rich people, and it doesn't have to be physician, I'm talking like a lot of wealth. And I think what you'll find is with a lot of them is what they really wanted was, was that time with their parents. So I think that is invaluable. That comes number one. I think we're blessed as physicians because, you know, while we're not ultra wealthy or anything like that, we do enjoy a pretty comfortable living. So I guess maybe that's why for me, that is secondary. I mean, I appreciate the fact that we can provide all of those things, but it's, it's definitely secondary. But like you mentioned, some of the financial aspects of it, I do think about ways to create passive income streams so that I can attain financial independence and, you know, be able to tailor my, my clinical practice to what is, you know, appropriate for me and my family. Yeah, let's talk about that a little bit, if you don't mind. I know it's a little bit of a segue, but I am curious about your thoughts about that. Yeah, so I mean, I'm a big believer in multiple income streams. To be able to create those, obviously, the first thing we have to do is spend less than we earn. I've interviewed a lot of financial bloggers, a lot of folks that have been financially very successful on my podcast, White Coat Investor, Physician on Fire, a few of the ones that come to mind. Um, but th- that's the first step. The first step is you know controlling our lifestyle, controlling our spending so that we have a savings. And then with that money, we can be good stewards of it. So my particular flavor or brand or whatever you want to call it is real estate. I like real estate, but you know, there's pluses and minuses to that. And depending on the person and what they like, you know, they, they can find the vehicle that, that they like and that suits their personality and needs. But that first step is being good stewards with our money so that, you know, we have choices later on. I like how these two topics are actually coming together. And I think you pointed out something that's really important. And when we're parents and we're busy doctors and we don't have as much time sometimes as we would like to be able to spend with our kids. And so I do find that docs tend to, and you know, a lot of busy professionals do this. They make that mistake of thinking that buying the kids stuff is going to, I mean, I used to do it. <laughs> Right. You think, it, you I mean, think it'll make it up for it. Because I was like, I'd feel guilty, right? And I would be on call or I'd miss something. So I would, you know, buy something to make up for it. Or I'd, instead of going to like grandparents' house, well, we're going to Disney or mm-hmm. we're going on a cruise or, you know, and it's, and I recall very specifically, like we took the kids to Disney. They're probably like four and six. You know, we lived in Colorado, so we had to take off time from work, go there, spend all the money. We stayed in the hotel on the property. Like, you know, we really did it up, right? Right. 
Well, I mentioned my kids are six or 17 and 19 now. And then we ask them, do they remember that trip? No. And how old they were they? They don't remember it. They were four and six, which four surprised six. me um, that they didn't remember that trip because I did. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but my point is sometimes we think that we're doing all these extra things for the kids in terms of material things. What they remember more is, you know, they, they remember like the time we went to grandma's house or the time we were, went on that, that trip where it wasn't like as extravagant, as outstanding as I <laughs> right. thought it was going to be. <laughs> well, it, you know, this is so apropos for us because we are planning a Disney, Disney World vacation. <laughs> and my, you didn't they'll know remember, this. They'll remember. And my two oldest are like three and it'll be like three and a half and five and a half so it'll be interesting if they you know how, how much of it they'll remember but we are trying to be a little bit more frugal about it as far as you know our lodging and and different things like that yeah what i i told what i tell them is that i hope that those experiences that they don't remember specifically are sort of blended into the uh, pleasant milieu of their life when they remember it, their childhood later. <laughs> that yeah, they sure. Remember that overall it was pretty good. <laughs> right. Yeah, and, and the time that you spent together, whether it's at Disney or somewhere else, and in the and the memories that you make, and as they get older, I'm sure, you know, there were there were some good memories there. Yeah, it was good for me. <laughs> 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 Which isn't bad, right? Because they were thinking about when we talk about parenting, mm -hmm. being a father, there's not just what we do for the kids, but how uh, being a father grows us and affects us as, as males, <laughs> human mm -hmm. beings, adults. How do you think that fatherhood has affected like the the way that you practice medicine? Has that affected it at all in terms of like the hours that you choose or the schedules that you make? Sure. So I'm very fortunate in that the private practice group that I practice with is amazing. You know, I moved my family when I finished with the Navy from Southern California to Dallas. And this was the one particular group that I was going to move my family for because I really liked the structure. I liked the camaraderie. I liked the, the setup of the group. And so we have a group set up where typically if you want to give up call, there's somebody who's in, who will pick it up because it's incentivized by, you know, by making money. And so that's really great because there are some people who would like to earn as much, you know, earn more because of whatever circumstances they have in life. Mm -hmm. And then there's people like myself who in this stage of my life, I, you know, maybe would like to give up a little bit of calls so that I can spend time with my family, work on a podcast, do different things that are important to me. So that's what's really great about having this type of a, a group structure and dynamic is that generally keeps everybody, you know, keeps everybody happy. So yes, having kids has affected all of those things that you mentioned. And I've been really fortunate because it has been relatively easy for me to adjust my practice. I'm still working full time, but mm -hmm. adjust, adjust some of that call and things like that a little bit to be able to, you know, take time for the things that matter for me. Some other people may not be as fortunate, but, you know, I've had this conversation as well with, with other physicians. We're in more control than we think. Even I think even in an employee model, whoever's listening out there, you have more control than you think. You have to be creative sometimes. And sometimes you have to basically stand up for your rights, stand up for what you want to do, the way you want to design your life and your career, and not in any mean way about it, but just be vocal and make it happen. Yeah, I agree with you. I think that that is something that I kind of talk a lot about in this physician wellness conversations when there can be more finger pointing like, oh, it's the establishment, it's the, it's the way that medicine is structured. And, and to, that is true to some extent, but ultimately hospitals and clinics and everybody that has employed doctors are making money off the backs of employed doctors, this, you know, or of doctors, if mm -hmm. these institutions would not run without us. And so I think we have underestimated the amount of 
power that we have. For example, if a doc leaves a practice, there's various estimates, but they run between like a half a million to a million dollars to replace a family practice doc. That's a lot of money. Yes. It's not just that doc's salary, right? It's that usually it takes a while to replace the doc. They have to recruit somebody. Also, that doc's panel is going to be completely different. So if they've built up a panel of, say, 1,500 to 2,000 patients, it's not guaranteed that all those patients are going to stay. Right. right. They want to follow Dr. Jones to wherever mm-hmm. they're going. And then also as doctors, we're leaders of our teams. And so when the leader leaves, what happens to the team? It usually doesn't stay together. Right. So now the nurses might go somewhere else or the techs, other doctors might be, you know, so it's like there's this huge I want to call it a domino effect, or maybe it's bowling pins. I'm not sure which you (laughs) want to use. Probably bowling pins is more. Yeah, right? More chaotic. It can be chaotic. You know, we need to keep that in mind as doctors when we're thinking that there aren't things that we can do to improve our own lives. There definitely are things we can do. And sometimes they're, you know, they may not be like changing the huge structure, but as you're saying, like in your group, right? There's, you want to give up calls, someone wants to take a call. And mm-hmm. so sometimes those agreements can be made between you and the other doctors in your practice without necessarily getting like the whole administration involved in all of that. You know, just things to make your life easier and, and better, you know, cover each other. You know, that's the kind of stuff that you would do more in private practice. And I love that and both of us come from private practice model. Well, you're in the Navy first and then private practice. Mm-hmm. But where we're, we come from feeling like we can run it how we want to run it. And I think some of those principles can definitely be taken into an employee model for sure. Yep, Mike, absolutely. What are three things... I, I love this because these aren't questions that I can answer myself because I'm not a father. <laughs> so what are three things that you think that men who are fathers or young men who are considering fatherhood should know? Well, I'll, I'll take my stab at it. So, so first of all, embrace the challenge and the responsibility. I just, I just want to put that out there. It's, it's so important for, for the children out there. And, and it's also I guarantee you it'll help you become a better person too. So just embrace the challenge and the responsibility of fatherhood. But really, really three things is, is what I would impart. Number one, we talked about a little bit, but it's, it's time. That is what I've noticed with, with my three young kids that they want from me more than anything else. They want my time. I open that door when I come home from work and they're still young enough. So that it's like, daddy, daddy, and I get the big hugs and they run over and it is like, it's Christmas because I got home. So yeah. I am enjoying that as long as it lasts. You know, I'll, you know, I'll go change. I'll sit myself on the couch. And, and Matthew, who's three, he's like, Daddy, get down on the floor. I want to play with you. And, and it's just like, okay, you know, it's like, all right, let's do this. So he's, he's, you know, he's like a three-year-old boy, super energetic. And I, I, you know, I do my best to keep up with him, but they want my time. Number two, they want us to be present. It's not enough just, just to be there. You have to be present. And, and I'll tell you, a li- I'll share a little bit of story. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and my wife is great because she reminds me when I need reminding to get off my phone and be present. And I'm not perfect at this. I, it's a work in progress, but I've gotten better and better. You know, I had a situation not too long ago and I'd got home from work. It was a long day, whatever. And I was sitting on the couch and I was on my phone. I don't know, nothing super important, checking email, social media, what have you. And Theodore, Theo, who is our youngest, about a year and 10 months, he was climbed up on the couch and I was kind of not completely aware, but he had climbed up on the couch and he was about ready to engage me. And he saw that I was on the phone and he stopped. Oh. And, it, and it was so powerful. He's not even two yet. And he was there like about to touch me and he just stopped because I was looking at my phone and was not paying attention. And wow. luckily, luckily I, I caught it. You know, I realized what was happening. I saw what he was doing and I was like, oh my gosh. So I, I just 
put my phone down real quick and I said, get over here. And I gave him a big hug and, you know, we started playing, but I could have, I so easily could have missed that opportunity for something that was not even important. So that's number two is just be present. And that goes for people who don't have any children either. You know, having our phone on us all the time, I've noticed for myself, it increases increases my stress and anxiety. If I'm on my phone, if I'm always checking the latest notification, I've started turning off notifications from my phone because they are not urgent. So, you know, set up, maybe set up specific times when you're going to check your phone and then just put it aside. I need to follow my own advice repeatedly, but I found that when I practice that, I feel better and I'm more present for my kids and I'm a better person. And kids are always paying attention is the last thing I would say. We don't realize that even when we don't think they're paying attention or listening, and my five-year-old daughter, she is the queen of this. (laughs) I have one too. (laughs) She is always listening. And she, I'm talking to my wife and we think we're having a private conversation and she's over, you know, on the other side of the room and she'll be like, what did you say? (laughs) They're all up in it. (laughs) They're they're all up in it. They're, They're listening all the time and they're paying attention to our actions too. So those are the three things that I would say, just, just be mindful and aware of and just go with it because, you know, the rewards, you know, the impact that you have on your kids, if, if you, you know, follow those things is just, you know, it's just amazing. Wow. Well said. I love it. I love it. Thank you so much, Dr. Dave Draginas. It was really good to talk with you today. Man, you know, I feel like talking about these issues, just talking about parenting and this what you might consider like the softer side of medicine or things that we may not talk about in, you know, in the doctor's lounge, but they're so important. And I'm really glad to have your perspective and have you share what you've shared today. Well, thank you very much for allowing me the platform and to speak on your podcast about fatherhood and medicine and how these things interact for me, because People forget sometimes physicians, you know, we're people too. We, you know, we have families, we have kids, we have loved ones. You know, it's important. It, it's, a, it's an important part of our lives. It's an important part of, you know, my personal well-being and health. You know, healthy doctors make for, you know, healthy patients, I think. So, so thank you again for the opportunity to talk about this with you and your audience. And uh, if anybody has questions or anything, I'd be happy to uh, communicate with them further. Why don't you go ahead and share with the the folks out there how they can get hold of you. My podcast is doctorsunbound.com. If you want to check it out there, you know, either the contact form, you know, on that page, doctorsunbound at gmail.com is my email on social media. Take your pick if you search for Doctors Unbound or my name, David Draginas, which is hard to spell, but it may be maybe it'll be in the show notes. Uh, Oh yeah. (laughs) Then you can definitely find me and I'd be happy to communicate with you and yeah, take it from there. Yeah. So all of the contact info will be in the show notes guys. So please refer to those. You can find those at drdiane.com. That's www.drdiane.com. Two N's and an E.com. Thanks again, Dr. David Draginas. Until next time on the Doctor's Life podcast, everybody, I hope you stay happy and healthy. Take care. Thanks for listening today. If you like what you've heard, be sure to hit subscribe in your podcast app so that you won't miss an episode. You can also read show notes, get links, and contact me by going to drdiane.com. That's www.drdiane.com. And docs, while you're there, take the physician vitality assessment, which will help you more clearly see if you are at risk for burnout.